Good evening and welcome to Bride Blue, to Drink Time for Bride Blue uh, with Professor Rob Ford. Um, so, for those who don't know, Bride Blue is an independent think tank from Fashion Group for Liberal Consulting, and that our research focuses on domestic, social, educational, environmental, and economic policy. Uh, in, in the times of old, we held these drink times in, 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 a, in a busy room at, at a pub. Alas, yeah, I think that should wait for a better, but we'll have a, have a great discussion nonetheless. Um, you're welcome to treat using hashtag bright blue and follow us at we are bright blue. Um, for this session, uh, Rob will talk for about 15, 20 minutes and then there'll be a Q&A session. If you would like to ask a question uh, during the Q&A session, you can, you can use Slido. So if you visit the Slido website and enter the ha hashtag bright blue, you will be able to ask a question for there and I will ask it. Um, so, and just briefly, I'm Anwar Sogolov. I'm a senior research fellow at Bright Blue who focuses primarily on welfare and social issues. But, uh, but more importantly, joining us today is Professor Rob Ford, who is a professor of political science at the University of Manchester. He is the author of several books on politics, including most recently Brexit Land, written together with Professor Maria Sobleska. And I think without much further ado, I will let Rob get on with it. Thank you, Anvar, uh, and thank you to Bright Blue for inviting me uh, to this. Uh, I, for one, would certainly have loved to uh, do this in a busy room in a pub, and perhaps one day we'll be able to do such a thing uh, again in the not too distant future. Uh, but this is also a pleasure, not least because as an academic, it's always great to be able to share my slides, uh, which is a bit more difficult to do in a pub. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, my new book with Maria Sobolewska, um, Brexit Land, uh, Identity, Diversity and the Reshaping of British Politics. Uh, and uh, I will try and compress roughly 400 pages of argument into about 50. So I'll do my best to go quickly, but because I'll be going quickly, of course, anything that's unclear, please do uh, ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, so first of all, the title. Um, the title uh, draws on uh, a very great piece of American uh, history, rather history rather than political science, uh, called Nixon Land uh, by uh, Rick Perlstein. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, <clears throat> and Perlstein had a very arresting line, which I think we used at some point in the book. He said, I've written of the rise of two American identities, two groups of Americans staring at each other from behind a common divide, each equally convinced of its own righteousness, each equally convinced that the other group was defined by its evil. And I really like this quote because I feel it summarizes something of the kind of emotional heat that uh, characterizes uh, identity politics as we've been seeing it uh, in recent years in British politics, something of the sort of moral intensity. Um, and to illustrate that kind of moral intensity, here's uh, the two groups of Brits staring at each, each other from behind a common divide. On the left, uh, an infamous uh, headline from the Daily Mail on the day of the 2017 election, uh, calling on the British people to crush the saboteurs. The saboteurs in question, of course, uh, being uh, Remain supporters, uh, referred to in this Daily Mail headline, like many, uh, as Ramonas. And then on the right, you see um, the uh, left, uh, the Remain left, kind of uh, responding in kind, uh, or even up in the ante, uh, with the headline. And this comes from my own hometown of Manchester, when the Conservative Conference was there uh, and a great big banner was put up saying hang the Tories uh, and in case the sentiment behind this was unclear uh, the creators of the banner also ensured that there were a couple of mannequins dressed in Bullingdon Club outfits literally hanging uh, from nooses and again I think what this captures is the emotional heat that we're dealing with in politics today and part of the task of the book is to try and explain how we've ended up with such uh, a heated and polarized political debate uh, around an issue which needn't, I think, generate such heat. Um, relations with the European Union are not necessarily a topic that immediately sets hearts on fire, yet that is, that is where we've ended up. And the reason, we argue, lies in a mixture of long-term structural demographic changes, which are shifting the basis of our politics, and also a series of important political choices along the way that have structured the particular form that these demographic changes have taken in terms of their expression in politics. 
The demographic changes, there's a few of them. The first very important one is educational expansion. Uh, it is often forgotten just how recent ma mass higher education is as a phenomenon in the United Kingdom. You only have to go back two generations uh, to the 1980s to have a situation uh, where the percentage of uh, voters in the electorate who had been to university was in single digits and the percentage of voters in the electorate who had no formal educational qualifications at all uh, was close to 50 percent. Uh, since then we've seen a near continuous shift uh, towards uh, higher educational qualifications in the uh, electorate and in particular a great deal more university graduates and that is important because university graduates have very distinctive views uh, on the kind of identity-based issues that form the basis of uh, the, the new political divides that we're seeing. Second change that's occurred over the same period of time uh, is the shift of Britain from being a close to mono-ethnic society um, two generations or so ago uh, to a situation in which it's a highly ethnically diverse society and one that's rapidly becoming uh, more diverse. This is figures just from the censuses since 1951. In the last census of 2011, uh, roughly one in eight uh, uh, residents of the United Kingdom identified with an ethnic minority group. That figure will be certain to rise sharply again uh, in the next census conducted next year. I wouldn't be surprised to see it up somewhere near one in five. Um, and the third demographic change which interacts with the other two is growing geographical polarization. So the, the first two changes have not proceeded at an even pace across the country and anybody who lives in a big city in England will be aware of just how distinctly diverse and graduate dominated and dominated particularly by young graduates cities have become in recent years and what this chart shows is the change in the percentage of residents who are from an ethnic minority group by the starting level of diversity and the simple message of the graph is the more diverse a place started in 2001, the bigger the shift to being more diverse that was seen in the, in the following 10 years to the next census. So places are polarizing on these dimensions as well. The places that were most diverse have become more rapidly diverse than the places that were least diverse. So the differences between places have grown. Now, alongside these demographic changes are a series of important political changes. A first is that the way we as a nation identify with parties has changed. Uh, and the reason it's changed is because the parties themselves have changed. Uh, the 1997 election was a watershed in this regard um, because with New Labour and Tony Blair, this was an election that marked the convergence of both parties on a broadly similar uh, set of economic uh, policies. Around about the same time, the parties were also converging in terms of what sort of MPs they were electing to Parliament. Even as recently as 1992, almost 30% of Labour Party MPs did not go to university. It's about 10% now. Uh, university graduates uh, basically dominate every single political party at the level of MPs. Uh, it's also true at the level of activists. Uh, it's also true at the uh, level of um, the party workers. Uh, it's a graduate dominated uh, institution, all the political parties at basically every level. And a third uh, element to this is how the parties campaign. Uh, in the 1950s, um, parties would campaign in their opponents' safe seats as they, they were mass parties, they had resources, and they wanted a presence across the whole nation. They wanted to be national parties. Uh, since again, particularly the era of Tony Blair, uh, declining memberships, uh, with obviously some brief reversal for Labour recently, but generally declining memberships and generally declining resources have meant the parties target their uh, attention much more closely on um, marginal seats and abandoned safe seats. And indeed, one long-term element to the very important Red Wall phenomenon that we saw in 2017 to 19 was these were seats that had not actually seen much activity from the Conservative Party for roughly 40 years, and the Labour Party wasn't particularly active in them either. Um, so they were actually more volatile than they appeared in part because there was no structured institutional local politics there in terms of the presence of parties. <clears throat> Another way in which parties and voters have gradually uh, drifted apart is related to the fact that parties are now very dominated by graduates. Uh, we see a growing elite mass gap 
again on the kinds of social and identity issues uh, where graduates tend to differ most from non-graduates. So this, for example, is the percentage of people, of MPs and then um, political candidates uh, who agree with the statement that equal opportunities for ethnic minorities have gone too far. And what you'll see is that a substantial minority of supporters of every political party agree with that statement, but virtually no candidates for the Labour Party or the Liberal Democrats agree with that statement, and far fewer candidates for the Conservatives agree with that statement than voters. So there's a consistent tendency for um, political candidates across the spectrum to have more socially liberal, identity liberal views than the voters who are putting them in office. Um, and that's important in turn because one thing that tends to bind voters to parties uh, where they no longer quite agree with the candidates the parties are putting forward or the idea, uh, the manifestos that a party is putting forward is partisanship. You know, it's the tribal gel that has traditionally held our politics together. Uh, you know, I am, you know, people say not I vote Labour or I vote Tory, but I am Labour or I am Tory. It's part of your political identity. But that has been fading also uh, along the same time period for, for roughly uh, a couple of generations now. And the share of the electorate that expressed no partisanship at all is now consistently higher than the share of the electorate that expresses a strong attachment to, to any of the political parties. So that's the background uh, to which the current political disruptions occurs. That's, that's the scenery of the stage, so to speak. And then the drama itself unfolds because of two very important mobilizing mechanisms, we feel. The first is ethnocentrism, which is a tendency to see the world in terms of us against them. We all will have encountered this in various um, walks of life. There are some people who are just very tribal and their, their team uh, are, can do no wrong and the other side uh, can do no right. Uh, and that, that tendency is well researched in, in social psychology, but uh, in the view of myself and Maria, um, under appreciated in its importance uh, for British politics, for example. It's very, very well understood its role in American politics, which of course we're seeing uh, very intensely just at the moment. Um, but it, it's, it's very important in British politics too, we argue, and has become more so. The second um, mechanism here is anti-prejudice norms. And this again relates to the phenomenon of a growing graduate and ethnic minority electorate. Uh, white graduates in particular tend to hold very intensely to uh, anti-racism as a central political value. It's very motivating for them and they regard it as a very important political uh, priority. Uh, alongside that, ethnic minority voters don't actually tend to rate anti-racism as a, a priority in quite the same way, but it is, it is an issue that is of inherent group importance to them because they are the ones who are likely to be on the receiving end uh, of prejudice and intolerance in society. So they will align uh, with uh, white uh, graduate liberals on identity issues for this reason, because they don't want to be on the receiving end of intolerance. And the two mechanisms that bring these new motivations into politics are activation, which is when issues that divide voters over identity emerge on the issue on the agenda, and then mobilization, which is when parties take distinctive stances on those issues. So, um, and all the way through here and in the book, we tend to basically use a kind of shorthand, uh, broad brush shorthand to describe the divide we're talking about. On the one hand, you've got identity liberals, which is two groups. It's white university educated voters for whom anti-racism is a central conviction, they're conviction liberals, and then ethnic minority voters for whom a less prejudiced society is a really important uh, goal because uh, it serves their group interest in all sorts of ways. So we call them necessity liberals. And then on the, on the other side to that, identity conservatives are tend to be white voters with low levels of formal education and often older uh, who tend to have strongly ethnocentric attitudes on a whole range of issues. So that's the broad brush dividing line that we draw. And there are loads and loads of issues where we can see that this dividing line does play out in practice. This is just a few examples. Uh, being born in Britain is very important to being British. A majority of white voters with low educational qualifications agree with that. A large majority of graduates and ethnic minorities reject that idea. Ditto with ancestry as a, a signal of identity and uh, ditto with uh, the belief that those who do not share British customs and traditions can never be fully British. And there are many other items uh, like that, um, that that explain this ethnocentric worldview. Now, in terms of activation, the big issue that activated all of this, and it began quite a long time ago, is immigration. 
Uh, immigration rose to the top of the political agenda in the early 2000s and remained there for 20 or well, 15 odd years until the EU referendum. There's no period before that in British politics um, uh, for which we have polling where that was true. Um, so this was an unprecedented uh, development. It was true even during the height of the financial crisis. You had a fifth or a quarter of voters saying, no, actually, it's not the financial crisis that most worries them, it's immigration. Um, and um, this remobilized uh, a divide that had actually first been mobilized during the first wave of immigration, which we discuss at length in the book. Um, Britain, unusually relative to other European countries, uh, had a very strong immigration divide uh, between its centre-right and centre-left parties from uh, the 1970s. Uh, it was a lasting impact uh, of Enoch Powell particularly, but also of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, when Powell mobilised against Commonwealth immigration in the late 60s and 1970s, it led to a situation in which voters basically took Powell's positions to be the Conservative Party's positions. And from that point onwards, the Conservative Party across all sorts of polling was rated by voters, in particular ethnocentric voters, as a, an immigration control party. Uh, so that, that was a long standing reputation that they had relative to Labour. Then really uh, critically, and this explains why, incidentally, we didn't see uh, the emergence of a major anti-immigration party in the 2000s when immigration first goes to the top of the agenda because actually the Conservatives benefited electorally from that. But that began to unra unravel when the coalition uh, took office uh, under David Cameron in 2010 because David Cameron and Theresa May had promised to reduce immigration to the tens of thousands. They could not deliver on that promise and they could not deliver on that promise in large part because of EU free movement policies. Uh, and what then happened was voters said, you said you were going to reduce immigration. The government said, oh, yeah, sorry, we haven't, uh, but next time we'll, we'll do better. And this would happen every quarter when the ONS published migration statistics. And this kind of cycle of failure um, completely destroyed the Conservatives' reputation uh, for being a party of immigration control in about three years. Uh, and uh, by about 2013, they were no longer rated um, very clearly as the best party on this issue. And that, not coincidentally, is exactly the point when support for the UK Independence Party begins to take off. Uh, and of course, what the UK Independence Party and Nigel Farage are able to do is to link the issue of immigration to the issue of the EU. And in doing so, they're pushing against an open door. It wasn't a fiction uh, when Farage and his colleagues said, um, well, we can't have the immigration control you want because we're in the EU and the EU free movement stops us from controlling immigration. That wasn't the whole truth, but it was a big part of the truth. So he was pushing against an open door in making that case. And that was important for what happened in the EU referendum because in the original EEC referendum in 1975, there was zero relationship between people's views of immigration uh, and their voting choices in that referendum. By the time of the referendum in 2016, the relationship between negative views of immigration and support for leave was close to one to one. Uh, I mean, pro-immigration voters actually divided a, a bit less consistently, but anti-immigration voters were very consistently lined up uh, with anti-EU positions by that point. And that was a new thing. It happened over the course of the 2000s and the 2010s and was directly related to the very high immigration we were having and the failure of the Conservatives uh, to uh, uh, come up with an effective policy in response to it. At the same time as all this is going on, broader identity issues are also becoming increasingly partisan. This, for example, is again that question about equal opportunities for ethnic minorities going too far. What we see is that, that uh, amongst voters, uh, the spread across parties on this view increases because uh, Labour and Liberal Democrat voters become more consistently liberal on these questions, whereas Conservative voters more or less stay where they were uh, at the beginning of the 2000s. So this is also becoming more politicised in the background. Um, and that's important because that brings us to what has often been uh, caric characterised, sometimes caricatured, as woke politics in recent years. And to my mind, there is a, a really important and emotionally heated argument at the heart of the whole woke politics debate. And it's kind of a paradox in a way. This, this debate exists precisely because it is so universally accepted in uh, British society today that racism is morally abhorrent. Because the stigma of racism is so strong it can cost you your job, it can cost you your friends. Uh, there is an incredibly intense argument about 
Uh, and what you see very often is um, very uh, identity liberal people pushing a, a really expansive definition uh, of racism and um, more sort of identity conservative, socially conservative people pushing back against it and saying that this is an infringement on free speech. And I, I want to emphasize that I feel is a real debate. I think some, some of the issues that it gets attached to can often look a bit silly, but that's the nature of symbolic politics. There is a real um, d divide, a real value divide at the heart of that. Uh, and I think it is one that will continue even after the EU divide stops. And uh, we did some work to show the power of this divide. Uh, so for example, we asked people, we gave people an experiment where we said to them, uh, you know, uh, imagine you're a manager at a supermarket that when people could go to supermarkets rather than ordering online and you have a rude customer or you have a, an employee being rude to a customer um uh what would you do and we gave them four different kinds of rudeness we randomly assigned the rudeness they could be rude about naughty children rude about the customer's poverty which we expected would be a powerful thing in a class divided society rude about a customer's english or make racist comments and what we found is that willingness to out and out fire the employee was far higher for the racist comments situation than any of the other scenarios. Uh, essentially, this confirmed our intuition that racism is just regarded as something that you have to take strong action against, which is why defining it becomes such an important issue. And then to explore the other side of this divide, we wanted to offer people, we wanted to see what happened if we offer people a reassurance that they could offer an opinion that might be um, you know, seen by some liberal people as a little bit, uh, uh, you know, of a grey area, if we gave them a signal that it was okay. Uh, and so we asked people about whether they thought London's growing ethnic and religious diversity is a good thing. But then uh, for some of the people, we said to them that people said that it's a good thing because that's the kind of political correct thing that people say these days. It's a kind of signal to them that it would be okay to think otherwise. And what we found is that when people were given the political correctness signal, they were more willing to say that uh, diversity might not be a good thing for London. They were reassured that they weren't gonna get uh, whacked for that opinion. So that again confirmed that people recognize some important stakes in these kinds of debates. Now, what does all of this have to do with Brexit? Well, Brexit is an identity divide that mobilizes those other identity divides. <clears throat> so it's a partisan identity in and of itself. The share of people who identify as leavers or remainers is way higher than the share of people who identify as Tory or Labour. And they feel stronger about it as well. So here, for example, these darker blue bars are share of people who say criticism of this party feels like a personal insult to me. And the share of people who say that about leave or remain is much higher than the share of people who say about the traditional parties. And anyone who's ever argued about Brexit on social media like I have will have encountered this. People take it massively to heart. So it's a tribal identity of its own, but it's built on those identity divides that I was just talking about. So lead voters tend to be ethnocentric white school leavers with socially conservative views. Remain voters tend to be socially liberal graduates with identity liberal views. Uh, now layered on top of that is they have these powerful badges of identity attached as well. And that brings me to my final slide. I think I'm okay for time, maybe slightly, slightly over, sorry, but I uh, did my best. Um, the three dilemmas that leaves us with in the world we're in now, and these dilemmas are the dilemmas we will still face on January the 1st next year after we leave, uh, whatever the terms we leave on. The first is the electoral dilemma. Um, so politics is realigning itself, reorientating itself around these kinds of educational, ethnic identity divides, and that poses problems for both parties. Uh, for the Labour Party, the problem is very simply stated, and we saw it very dramatically in 2019. Uh, Remain voters tend to all concentrate in the same places, leave voters are more spread out. And in the first past the post system, that's disastrous, because you can win like 150 seats with enormous majorities and then lose everywhere else. Um, that's a hopeless position to be in as a party. So they, they, although their support is extremely, is increasingly dominated by these identity liberal voters, they have to reach across that divide or they can't hope to win. The divide for the Conservatives is a little bit different. They have an advantageous position now, but it's unlikely to last forever because of those engines of dem demographic change I'm talking about. So the risk is that they eat their own seed corn. Uh, and find themselves in a position where they're on the wrong end uh, of demographic change, maybe a decade from now. Plus, of course, you know, the tide goes out for parties for other reasons as well. Uh, and then they could face 
just as Labour faced emerging challenges in the red wall that they thought was safe for generations. If you look at the seats in a great big C-shaped arc of suburbia around London, you look at the biggest swings away from the Conservatives, generally to the Liberal Democrats rather than Labour, they're in those seats and it's, it's those identity Liberal graduates leaving the party. It's like a sort of early signal of what might be coming in the next few election uh, cycles for the Conservatives. So they have a dilemma of, on the one hand, they need to retain this new identity Conservative electorate. And on the other hand, uh, they, they, they can't afford to put at risk um, wealthy graduate Liberals uh, who might be tempted uh, to different parties now. The partisan dilemma is how do parties deal with their activists on these issues? Because the other thing is that both parties now have activists who tend to, to one very strongly to one poll on these divides, but they need to um, offer more moderate views uh, on these divides. Um, I, I might just leave it at that uh, on that one because I know we're short on time. And then the policy dilemma is identity will tend to leak into other arguments, including arguments about many issues that don't really seem to be about identity. Uh, one example is welfare. I've done a lot of work on this showing that once you make salient to voters in Britain um, uh, that uh, people claiming welfare are immigrants or are racially different, it dramatically changes the kind of people who support and oppose welfare policies. This is likely true in other areas of policy too. And here is an example of an area where we might end up America might end up being a kind of uh, example of where we might end up going next. Because we're becoming a more diverse society, a lot of other issues, social mobility, education, welfare, are likely to acquire an identity dimension. There are parts of the identity liberal left that actively want it to acquire an identity dimension. But if you make those issues issues with an identity dimension, you completely change the coalitions of people for and against those particular policies. And that, again, is a dilemma for both parties because it changes the political argument in very unpredictable ways. Uh, so that I'll stop there. Uh, I'll just leave you with this slide uh, with people saying nice things about my book, which would make an excellent Christmas present for yourself or for the other politics addicts in your lives available now from all good uh, online and offline bookstores. So uh, I hope you will consider, uh, I hope that uh, taster of what the book is about might uh, encourage you to consider having a look at it. And now I'll take questions. Thank you, Rob. That was, uh, that was quite a crash course last night. Everything that has affected and influenced British the current state of British politics. And I mean, to, to, echo, the, uh, to echo your mentioning that I, I have also been looking for your, for your book. And <laughs> yeah, so my recommendation went not quite as, as late as I want to mention, but yeah. So I think uh, just to repeat for the audience, we if you would like to ask a question, you should use a slider. You should go to slider.com and enter hashtag bright blue, and you can ask your question for there. Um, and before we get into the audience questions, I do have a single um, question for you, Rob, actually, uh, kind of touching on something that you briefly mentioned and discussed a bit more in the book. So you distinguish two groups of identity liberals, uh, the conviction of identity liberals and then the necessity. Um, identity liberals, it was a necessity on between basically ethnic minority voters. And I was wondering where you think there's kind of a potential for some of those necessity liberals voters to shift into the almost like an identity conservative voters, kind of thinking about kind of the experience of British Indians in particular who become interested in the like, feel it and identifying as an uh, in group rather than an out group uh, individuals, and kind of the same kind of shift potentially happening with, for example, British Polish. Um, so I was wondering what, what you think about that. Yeah, I, I think that it's quite possible. Um, I mean, one of the big surprises in the US last month was the shift of a sizable chunk of the African-American population, but particularly a sizable chunk of the Latino population um, behind uh, the Republican Party and Trump. Uh, and that threw a lot of the more sort of liberal uh, Democrats commentators for, for a bit of a loop. But when you look at the underlying attitudes of these voters, it's not it's not surprising. Clearly, they did not see Trump as, as threatening as he had been portrayed to be in 2016, and therefore they were willing to give him another look. And I think it's very much the same dynamic, although not as intense, in Britain. The Conservatives' problem with ethnic minority voters is very simple to state and very hard to resolve. It's that for an awful lot of ethnic minority voters, when push comes to shove, they think that the Conservative voters if faced with a situation where they have to choose between 
addressing the anxieties of identity conservative white voters about them uh, and addressing uh, and protecting them from those anxieties that they'll side with the former that they'll adopt the anti-immigration policies uh, that that you know you'll get situations like uh, Windrush and so on and there's lots of quantitative and qualitative efforts uh, uh, research to show that 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 enduring reputation of not a party that listens to our concerns has been a real problem for the Conservative Party. But it is by no means a necessary thing that that would continue. And of course, we have uh, the Conservatives of the first two ethnic minority chancellors, the first ethnic minority Home Secretary. Uh, Stephen Bush argued recently, and I'd be inclined to agree with him, that probably the first ethnic minority Prime Minister, excepting, of course, uh, ben, uh, Benjamin Disraeli, uh, will likely be uh, a Conservative. Um, and at some point, those kind of things will have a cumulative impact, perhaps. Uh, so it's quite possible that those groups can flip. And on many issues, you know, the role of faith, the role of family, um, the role of small business, many of these groups are, and it's long been observed, quite conservative um, with a small C rather than a big C. And it's that point where that circuit breaker barrier, that they're not a party that like us, they're not a party that are comfortable with us, that we can be comfortable with. When that barrier breaks down, then there's no reason why you couldn't see quite large swings uh, to the Conservatives uh, uh, among some of these groups. I think, like as you know, the British Indians are perhaps the likeliest group because their social demographic position is very middle class at this point. Uh, many of them are also... Uh, like Priti Patel, descendants of the Ugandan Asian population that Ted Heath let in, and that has left them with a lasting, more positive view of the Conservatives than other uh, ethnic minority groups. So yes, uh, I, I would uh, emphasise that necessity is in the sense of how they perceive it, not in the sense of they're necessarily always going to be uh, on the liberal left. Thank you, Rob. Uh, and now, kind of turning to the audience questions, we have uh, one from Peter asking on whether there's any electoral wisdom in conservative MPs but put, putting more emphasis on fighting the culture wars, whether that will be something that will win them votes or lose them votes in the future? It's, it's, it's a tricky one because it comes into that, that um, geographical dilemma um, that the party faces. I think uh, on some issues there potentially is some electoral wisdom in them emphasizing a socially conservative stance where a position is taken that's clearly outside of the mainstream. I mean, I use an example from the recent, you know, Black Lives Matter protests. You know, I, I really think that the particularity in context matters in these situations precisely because they're so heated. So I thought Johnson played this quite well. So he didn't really say much about the Colston statue um, when that went into uh, the river in, in Bristol. Um, you know, he said it was wrong people breaking the law, but he didn't really say offer an opinion on whether or not the statue should have come down or not. But then when people, when they boarded up the Churchill statue on Parliament Square because there were worries that the protesters would vandalise it, then he came in very strongly behind that. So he waited until he had a position that was like 80% of the public would be behind him. And then he said, well, you know, that's where I'm going to plant my flag. And I thought that was very, very politically astute because there is a kind of judo move that I think the conservatives can pull on these kinds of issues. You know, in, in judo, which I was never very good at, but my brother was good at, you, you look to use your opponent's uh, aggression against you, against them. Their momentum pulls them into a position you don't have to do anything practically. And on some of these issues, there is a, a very, very intense uh, views uh, amongst some of the activists in this area, which leads them to adopt positions that are really quite a long way out of the mainstream. And that's that's your opportunity to pull a judo move in and just kind of go after that particular position that can be quite electorally beneficial. The risk is if you end up being seen as, as, as going against the tide on a position that's, you know, 60, 70% the other way. I see. So you, I guess what you're saying that if they in kind of like if, I, if they're responding to certain cultural moments, it can be quite war, war situations that might affect it. But I guess to kind of quickly follow up on, on that is, do you think, what about kind of just creating a culture, kind of a, like raising the sailings of an issue that is kind of like a culture war? I think that would be riskier um, because I think the advantage of responding rather than instigating is, you, you know, it, it looks like um, 
it, it looks like you're the ones who are adopting the common sense position and saying, well, this this is not what people care about. Let's 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 be sensible here. Whereas if you instigate things, it can it can easily be framed by the other side as um, aggression or as um, uh, distraction in particular. Um, so in, in a way and the thing is. It's a definite, I think, structural weakness of the left, not just in this country, but in a number of countries now, that they have an activist base that's very keen on arguments that most voters don't care about. So I don't really think there's much need for the right to sort of G these things up. They'll happen on their own, I think, because of the internal dynamics of the of the left. I see. Um, question from Anonymous, who's, who assesses to you giving a brilliant speech. Um, and then he asks, he says he spoke a lot about graduates and wonders whether, what is the importance of student voters in particular? So the influence of students, did you say? Yeah, of student voters, yes. What is their importance? Um, it's, I mean, that is part of it, but it's a small part of it. Um, what, I mean, it's not really student politics either in the sense of students are a big part of this electorate because they are a part of it, but not a very big part of it, nor is it student politics in the sense of it's not everyone's going to join the, you know, um, local branch of the student union and getting radicalized that way because it's only a tiny majority of people who go to university get involved in student politics and this effect this liberalizing effect of higher education seems to apply, I wouldn't say uniformly, but it seems to apply very broadly and it's very powerful. Um, uh, you know, the um, I've got a PhD student working on this right now. Um, if you if you take the, the best design to uh, sort of identify this is called a cohort study, where you go and interview people in multiple sweeps, like in um, that seven up documentary that used to run or may still run. And you go every few years and you see how their attitudes are changing. And if you look in those cohort studies at what happens to the kids after they've gone to university and you take the ones who did and the ones who didn't, the ones who did all become more liberal on these issues and then it lasts for the rest of their lifetimes and the ones who didn't don't become more liberal. Um, so there clearly does seem to be a substantial and lasting impact of the experience of being at university. And the obvious follow-up question to that is, well, why? And the truth is it, we don't know, but it's probably a whole package of things that all come together in a university experience of which I guess student politics is one part, but it's a pretty minor part. Cause like I say, uh, most students, believe me, as someone who teaches a lot of them, you know, the ones who are in student politics, you hear about it, but they are a pretty small minority of the students as a whole. Um. And just I guess to follow up, do you think there's anything to the idea of it being driven by kind of openness to experience? Because there's obviously been quite a bit of work about kind of if psychological traits affect voting choice. And do you think probably just to be in effect is on the US kind of like increasing openness to experience and that having an impact? Yes, I think that that is a very plausible um, facet of this. Uh, and I think that the university inherently is about uh, questioning your past experiences and opening yourself to new experiences. You move to a new city, you learn about new subjects, you meet new friends who often come from very different backgrounds uh, through your courses, but also through just living in a different place away from your family for the first time. You combine that whole cluster of experiences together. And I think it's fairly intuitive that for a lot of people, what that will produce is a sort of secular increase in their openness to experience, because that's kind of an obvious outcome of all of those things sort of shaking up. Whereas, I mean, to contrast it, and you know, David Goodhart, I think caricatures sometimes on this, but I think that the core intuition is right. If you basically spend your whole life in the same town, uh, I mean, in the same friends and family social networks as you were born into, and you never have that moment of a clean breakout and starting in a new place, then all else being equal, probably that is going to lower your openness to experience and increase the importance of other things like community and continuity and stability in your personality orientation. So, yeah, I think that's quite a plausible uh, hypothesis for this. Thank you. Um, another question from um, um, an anonymous viewer um, asking, what are strategies that the parties pursue exactly in order to maintain power? Is it about catering directly to the tribal instincts of voters? And where does that lead? Well, I mean, parties' strategies for uh, maintaining or acquiring power are, are always a little bit like that sort of um, 
talent show act um, that at least I grew up with, uh, where you get the, the chap uh, who tries to spin as many plates as possible and keep them all spinning um, without any falling off. So it's, it's never just one thing. Uh, there's always a whole uh, range of things that parties try to do. But I think it's very clear. Uh, I mean, to take one very potent example, if you look at party conferences every year, there are, you know, speeches from the, the leader on down are full of tribal partisan symbology and references. Our tribe is good. Our tribe has done great things. Their tribe are bad. Their tribe are a threat to the country and all this kind of stuff. It's it's very, very, I mean, in a way, it's what, one of the other reasons we were very keen to write this book because it felt like this is so obvious and central to everybody that they miss or underplay its importance in all this. People like to think that voters are sort of like shoppers or rational calculating machines looking at policies and looking at the state of the economy and uh, reacting accordingly, but they're not. They're human beings with very powerful, emotive, social types, uh, and they value those attachments and like having them sort of stoked up and mobilized and respond to politicians who do that. Uh, so yes, I, I think it's certainly a big part of any party's winning strategy is to do that. But of course, it's that balancing act coming back to the spinning plates of if you, if you do that too much, you put off voters who don't have those kinds of partisan impulses and put a kind of ceiling on your support. So you've got to find a way that mobilizes the partisans while also appealing to the, the less strongly partisan. Thank you. Uh, another question from Kate, returning to kind of some of the identity politics themes, asking how much of a danger zone is the issue of trans rights in particular for the Labour Party? I mean, I guess you mean danger in the electoral sense. Um, uh, I, I think it's hard to say, really. Uh, oddly enough, I think it's, it's such a... Um, esoteric debate for most voters that it might actually some weirdly limit its its um, electoral danger to Labour in that I don't think voters will necessarily respond like with particular hostility to either side of that debate but just find the whole thing very confusing and not very important so it, it's it's risky to them in the sense that it, it ends up distracting them from other things and makes them look a little bit out of touch why are they focusing on this I don't really care about this type thing um, but I think it's probably got less hot button power than say something like immigration where people have very powerful views of their own on it. Uh, I think the large mass of voters don't tend to have particularly strong or well entrenched uh, views. I mean, that could change of course, but as things stand, I don't think they have particularly strong views uh, on, on that, on that debate. So they more see it as sort of a little bit weird and esoteric and they're not really sure why everyone's getting so worked up about it. So there's, there's some risk there from that but not as big a risk as there are on other issues where you end up at odds with the sort of firm and well articulated and strongly held views of voters. Yes. Uh, another question from another anonymous viewer. Um, so I was saying from the slide, it looks like the growth in education is correlated with the following party. Is that correct? So I didn't quite catch the question so, there. Uh, let me read it. Uh, from the slides, it looks like the growth in education is correlated with the fall in party leadership. Is that correct? Is that yeah, right? but correlation is 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 not causation in this uh, respect. Most definitely, in fact, uh, quite the opposite. We do unpack it a little bit in the book. Uh, the, the fall in uh, partisanship and all these kinds of things is very much concentrated amongst uh, non-graduates. Actually, graduates. Uh, another thing that's very strongly correlated at the individual level of university education is is partisan attachments. Uh, so those two trends do correlate with each other, but that's not a causal um, relationship, most definitely. Uh, in, in fact, what's going on under the under the hood, so to speak, is a kind of polarization of political, and not just partisanship, but also things like political trust, uh, turnout, political engagement, political interest. All of these things are polarizing by education levels. So they're tending to be stable amongst graduates, but they've completely collapsed amongst, uh, particularly amongst younger, like uh, white school leavers under uh, like 40 uh, who have like GCSE or less qualifications 
Uh, the, their level of interest in politics is just incredibly low now. Their political trust is incredibly low. Um, so although there is a correlation between those two things, the, the, what that means is, is actually rather more complicated. Uh, and again, is, is a story of educational polarization. Another question um, about from, you know, I'm you're asking, um, how would you compare the UK with the US in terms of economic and geographic polarization? It's a good question. Uh, I mean, I did make a couple of nods to the US in, in the talk. I mean, the, the US is, is, is just you know, it's just this unique in two regards compared to any European country. The, the first is their history of polarized racial politics really doesn't have an analog anywhere else. Uh, the, the depth, well, I mean, aside from say somewhere like South Africa, maybe, uh, or perhaps in a different way, India, but certainly nowhere else in Europe, the, the, the existence of a formal system of segregation and mass disenfranchisement for uh, you know uh, uh, 200 odd years in a large part of the territory there's no analog for that anywhere else and it's reflected in the voting behavior of americans like since forever like uh, african americans incredibly strongly aligned with the democratic party uh, white Americans with identity conservative views, nationalistic, uh, racially conservative, racially intolerant, very, very strongly aligned with the Republican Party. That And the, 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 it's qualitatively different, just very much stronger. The second, which is related, is that their, their system of partisanship, their two-party system, it's more totalizing than ours. Uh, everything is divided between Democrats and Republicans at every level of American politics. Uh, and the level of partisan identification there is again, just it's without parallel in the world. And its effects are genuinely extraordinary to me sometimes. As someone who's researched politics for coming on 20 years now, I'm still staggered by the extraordinary power of the distortionary lens of partisanship in America. Um, you know, there's just, and, and that has increased over time. There's just very little about the world that Democrats and Republicans will agree upon uh, about any issue and how to interpret any issue in a complicated world. And we see some of that, I think, uh, in Britain. And I think that the the strength and spread of leave and remain identities was a little bit American style politics. It was like a, here's a little bit of a taster of what the Americans have been living with for a long time. In that, again, we had this kind of ubiquitous uh, politicization of a lot of complex issues. And there was just really very little common ground between the two sides about uh, what those issues meant, uh, about, uh, you know, meant in, not just in normative terms, good or bad, but in factual terms, what was true and what wasn't. Um, and so that was a little bit like the American situation, but perhaps as because I'm a little bit of an optimist by temperament, I, I think because there's all sorts of structural things that ratchet that kind of politics up in America that, that don't really have analogues here, I don't think we'll end up at that level of intensity. Um, but I think one of the one of the legacies of the referendum will be there'll be more of that flavor to some of the arguments we have in politics than perhaps we've been used to before. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a child of the new Labour era, you know, I'm a child of soggy centrism. Uh, and I, I think those days are, are gone for the moment <laughs> in terms of how we do our politics. <laughs> yes, certainly. Thanks, so too. Um, I guess a quickly follow up on, on that question, I guess, particularly on the urban rural divide, which I think is, comes across very prominently in, in, in US politics. Does that kind of transpose in a similar kind of way to, to UK, you think, or will at some point, because of, of the previous device we're talking about, or will be not quite as bad. It does, it does, it does, but because it's, because it's, and I think this is true in America as well, it, a large part of it, although not all of it, but a large part of it is compositional. It's simply that the kinds of people who live in big cities are very different to the kinds of people who live in small towns and rural areas, uh, much more ethnically diverse, much more young people, much more graduates, um, much more people um, uh, with liberal values working in liberal jobs. Um, uh, so that, that's very evident in America, and I think that's evident here too. Uh, and um, I think it's likely to continue because another feature of mass higher education is it's like an ever-expanding sorting hat for entire cohorts. 
uh, you know, um, 18 year olds when they're leaving school now, half of them go to university and then they go on to jobs in big cities. They tend to then sort into that big city graduate context. The other half stay where they are, get jobs where they are. Um, and, um, you know, those places change as well because the graduates all leave and don't come back. So and, and the more uh, university education has expanded, the more kids are going into that sorting hat and the more we're getting that geographical um, segregation. And I see no reason to expect that process to to even slow down, let alone reverse. So I, I agree that we will maps of urban rural divides will increasingly show a very strong party divide mapped on top of that it's not because of anything about being in the countryside or being in a city but it's about the kind of people who end up in those places thank you i think we might have a time for just one or two more questions um because we've you know, approached the half hour mark um i think one question Kind of ask a bit about the electoral kind of indications of this. There's been quite a bit of a debate in the conservative space currently about well, like there needs to be a choice to be made between kind of like the new North and Red Bull voters versus kind of the old South English voters. And so like the conservative kind of need to commit a bit more to one side or the other. Do you think this is a bit of do you think that's a false dichotomy here or do you think that is a presence of a choice? Uh, it's difficult. I mean, it goes to the heart of this dilemma that I think um, on, on the conservative side in that on the one hand, what we saw in 20 generally socially liberal, but very well off traditional Southern Tory voters were not willing to um, uh, leave the fold in very large numbers. And that was an important and I think under certainly underestimated outside of the conservative party in the labor debate for example that was a really important uh, element of that electoral success if you build a big tent coalition you've got to hold both sides of the tent um the question is whether or not that continues and that's a really difficult question to answer um i think the way i would put it is those groups are going to be difficult to it's plate spinning again it's going to be difficult to keep both of those plates spinning to keep both of those groups satisfied because not only are your sort of new conservative red wall voters in the midlands and the north not only are they socially much more conservative than um tory voters in say the south um many of whom are also of course quite socially conservative um but on average they probably lean more liberal especially the younger ones the, these voters are also much more economically left-wing, much more economically interventionist. And uh, Johnson's kind of fuzzy interventionism, I think, fits that space quite well. But, of course, we've just had the biggest spending splurge since the Second World War. And if you're fiscally conservative, Southern conservative, worried about what this means for your taxes, um, you may want to see that spending coming down. But if you are a um, fiscally uh, quite left wing populist Tory voter in the north, Brexiteer Tory voter in the north, you're really not going to want to see that spending come down. So in a funny sort of way, this could become this is tricky terrain to navigate when politics is about Brexit and about identity. It's actually even trickier terrain to navigate when politics shifts back as it could at any time to economic arguments again. Um, uh, so it will be it will be hard work and in a weird sort of way if the liberal democrats became kind of more orange bookie kind of more like the fdp were in uh germany for a while and the was it guido vestavella uh, when they did quite well got about 10 percent you know sort of socially liberal economically and fiscally conservative that could be a real threat to the Conservative Party in a lot of these traditional Southern seats. So they're probably quite relieved that that doesn't seem to be the direction of travel in the Liberal Democrats right now. But of course, that could change. Uh, parties can change, so. Yeah, some Liberal Democrats are in some way a hostage to fortune, but like what the other parties do. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's helping the Conservatives on that front is the Liberal Democrats are really very activist dominated party and their activists are not at present uh, economic Conservatives. <laughs> Yes. Um, I guess one very last question as, as, as we wrap up to return to the to Brexit actually. Um, 
So of course the Brexit question, I guess, is kind of seeing seeing a settled now in the political arena, at least in, in England, with both the Labour and Liberal Democrats kind of trying to move us behind it. But there's clearly kind of a core of quite Europhile voters who might even be interested in rejoining, for example. Do you think there's a threat to the kind of like more central left parties from kind of like insurgent kind of like rejoin movement in the next decade or so? Um, I mean, uh, I'm wary of making really strong statements uh, uh, given how unpredictable our politics has been, but this is one where I'm sorely tempted to do so and I'm sorely tempted to say no, um, because I just can't see a way in which it acquires the kind of totemic importance that, say, independence did in Scotland and that Brexit did amongst identity conservatives in um, in England and Wales uh, ahead of 2016, because both the independence movement and the Brexit movement were actually about far more than that. They were very effective packages for bundling together a bunch of value orientations, identity attachments, long-standing resentments, Whereas what's the bundle that you bundle together behind rejoin? Um, you know, because the kind of voters you're appealing to right there are not voters that, that have been poorly catered to by the political system. They're not voters who tend to feel particularly um, resentful about the status quo. Uh, they tend to like the EU, yes, but uh, aside from the very passionate small minority that we see a lot on Twitter, not not it is, it is not a, a love of overwhelming passion. It's more a sort of pragmatic institutionalism. I think it's much more likely that we have like, you know, a gradual incremental shuffling in the direction of the EU over time. Um, uh, and that if anything, extremely committed rejoiners just become a, a kind of irritation to the centre-left parties within their activist base because they're actually not representing even the views of most activists but they'll want to try and hijack the agenda and the rest of it and just cause a lot of arguments. I Also it's just not, I mean once it's done and I think this is actually one of the best arguments the Brexiteers have, have, have had all along and why get, getting Brexit done was, was, was a very clever goal to focus on. Because I just think there's an asymmetry there. It's, there's, there's long-standing evidence for status quo bias in politics. Uh, getting people worked up about preventing a change from coming in is a lot easier than getting them worked up about reversing it once it's happened. I and mean, look at what happened in Norway. They had a 52-48 referendum, um, you know, and they never revisited it. Um, uh, if anything, they look set to revisit it in terms of moving further out rather than further in. So I, I don't see it uh, in the next 10 years. And uh, you feel free to play that clip back to me when the rejoin party is polling 15% a year from now. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that's my hostage to fortune to end on. <laughs> yes, I mean, predictions are always dangerous nowadays. But... Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's all we have time for. And very much thank you. Um, Rob, for um, speaking and, and, and providing so much, so much rich detail and, and context for, for, the, for the changes that are coming. Um, I guess just a quick plug in for, for Bright Blue. So Bright Blue, we are uh, a member uh, organization and you're very welcome to become a member of Bright Blue by visiting our website. Uh, members of Bright Blue will get invited, will, are invited to a Christmas quiz later this week, which I'm sure will be lots of fun. And, uh, will provide a suitable replacement for the, for the usual gathering we usually have um, at this time. And once again, thank you to Rob and I want to wish everyone um, a happy holiday season. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Merry Christmas.